Thank you, Cynthia. The Commission referred to the problem of domestic violence as con conjugal disharmony. They approached it with great sympathy for the plight of the police officer who was caught in a position where he only had three options, he only had three options, of arrest, uh, forced removal from the house without arrest, or mediation, which might depend on how skilled uh, or personality appropriate that might be uh, something the officer could provide. Um, they also laid a general foundation for suggesting that police take problems apart that anticipated the later movement towards problem-oriented policing. And I think with the emphasis on research, they laid a foundation for a phrase we've heard repeatedly this morning, which is evidence-based policy. And the problem with that phrase, which lacks consistent definition, is that to the extent that people understand it, they uh, focus on the question of test, of what works. Um, but equally important, if not more so, in evidence-based practice is uh, targeting uh, different categories of problems rather than lumping them all together, um, as well as tracking what is actually going on in terms of the criminal justice responses to those problems and compliance with policies that are proposed. A prime example of tracking, however, which has long existed in criminal justice, is the crime count and the extent to which uh, we know whether the crime counts in various categories are going up or down every year. I think what happened in policing domestic violence in the 50 years since the commission recommendation um, was a focus heavily on testing the problem that the commission identified without sufficient attention to targeting the nature of the problem and the harm associated with it, which required the kind of uh, solution testing that has never happened. What do I mean by targeting? Four people were shot to death in Nashville in the pancake place. How many people were killed, how many women were killed by their intimate partners on that day in the United States? Well, I don't think anybody knows that number. We don't track that number. We know more, thanks to the Washington Post, about the number of people killed by police every year than we know about the number of women killed by their partners. If anybody has that number rolling off their tongue right now, shout it out to me. But based on CDC's estimate that 55% of all murders of women are, in fact, murders committed by their intimate partners, we can estimate that the number is close to five a day based on uh, 3,208 women reported murdered in the year 2016. Of course, if all five women today to be murdered by their partners were killed right here, right now, it would be headline news. But that's no way to target problems, not by their headline power, but by the sustained loss of life and the misery that it causes to families, not just from the people who die, but the people who are shot and critically injured for life, unable to raise their children, and to deal with the strong community consequences of this high-end harm. But what has happened in the time period since the commission is this focus on the three choices that they made that led to the Minneapolis domestic violence arrest experiment in 1984 that, unlucky for the science of external validity, happened to be done in a low unemployment town where arrest had a deterrent effect that was not replicated in other communities with much higher unemployment rates, uh, later understood better by looking at the moderator effect of unemployment on uh, the recidivism of people arrested for domestic violence, uh, which showed that uh, arrest works pretty well uh, to deter people who have jobs from having repeat domestic violence, and it doubles the rate of domestic violence for unemployed people who are arrested. Uh, that was something that the NIJ's randomized controlled trials funded in Milwaukee and in Omaha and in Miami showed very clearly, uh, uh, strikingly so because the three different demographic groups, predominantly African-American in Milwaukee, predominantly Hispanic in Miami, and predominantly white working class in Omaha, were so different, and yet the moderator effects uh, with respect to employment uh, showed uh, almost identical patterns. So why is the focus on that choice uh, which led, after the Minneapolis experiment, uh, sadly, to 28 unrepealable laws uh, across the 50 states requiring the police to make arrests whenever they see a 
uh, evidence that a misdemeanor domestic violence case has occurred, uh, the only misdemeanor for which that's true under the U.S. legal system. And I think to, to ask why that's not good enough for victims, why it's not really focused on the question of helping victims, uh, we only need to point to the long-term death rates of victims whose abusers were arrested in Milwaukee, who were 64% more likely to die of heart attacks, cancer, and other causes than the same kinds of people in a randomized trial of 100, sorry, 1,113 victims uh, whose uh, partners were either arrested or warned. The warned victims were more likely to be alive. They uh, had half the death rate if they were African American when their partners were warned that they had if the partners had been uh, arrested. So why does this victim unfriendly, in fact, victim high harm policy persist? And my answer is that it's a fig leaf. It's a fig leaf against the true target, which is the five women a day who are getting murdered. And uh, in relation to claims that have been made, that mandatory arrest prevents murder. And yet with the 23 year follow up in Milwaukee, we found that out of those uh, 1,100 some victims, only three of them had been murdered in exactly the same proportion as uh, arrest and warning had uh, been administered. So very low base rate and no difference between the treatment outcomes. Absolutely no evidence that mandatory arrest has a preventive effect on homicide. Strong evidence that it increases mortality for other reasons. Uh, at the state level, uh, Iyengar has suggested that um, murders of women go up when mandatory arrest is imposed. You can't touch the mandatory arrest issue because it is a fig leaf against these women getting killed. But key question that nobody ever asked, how many of them had had prior contact with the police? And the answer in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, is consistently that the women who are getting killed are not women who have previously come to police attention with that partner in the vast majority of the cases. So the idea that the police can prevent murder by making arrests at the prior stage before it escalates, and incidentally, all of the systematic studies with large cohorts, up to 300,000 now in Kent Constabulary in England, shows there is no escalation. The escalation is a myth. It's something that came out of clinical research, not systematic sampling of the kind that the commission pioneered in uh, so many other areas. The area of domestic abuse has not only resulted in all of the harms that I've mentioned, but it has put a huge number of women in jail and in some cases in prison in what's uh, uh, called mutual combat arrests uh, by the police whose response to mandatory arrest has been to arrest both parties. Uh, and that has not helped anybody. It hasn't helped the police legitimacy crisis. The very high proportion of black males have been arrested in inner cities for domestic abuse. I think the commission that we hope will occur needs to consider not only the specific issue of the future of domestic violence research and policy, but the need to link much better targeting research to the inventory of tests to be done that can then inform the tracking to see whether we're actually making progress. Because at this point, I'd have to say, uh, we don't have any evidence that progress has occurred. In some ways, I'm inclined to believe that we've only made things worse. Thank you very much. Okay, 